All right, what's up, everyone? MK Tom Brady here. So in this podcast, I've got a real treat for all of you. Uh, some of you know this guy as, you know, James MK. He came back into the MK scene around MK9. And some of you guys look at him as kind of like a loose cannon who's on Twitter and whatever. But long before that, uh, as James Fink, he actually was not only the first ever truly high-level Mortal Kombat player, but a lot of you guys got into Mortal Kombat with MK1 and MK2 on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis or, or, or any one of these home consoles, Game Boy, Game Gear, etc. Uh, he worked for Acclaim, and he was directly involved in the making of these games on the home console. So I'd like to introduce my guest, James Fink. Jimmy, what's going on tonight? Not much, man. Just uh, relaxing on a nice, quiet day. All right, so... Let's get right into this here. So Mortal Kombat 1, this is where it all started. Uh, you were working for Acclaim, right, over in Long Island? Yes, over in Oyster Bay, Long Island. Okay, so the Mortal Kombat arcade launch was October 8th, 1992. But you at Acclaim actually got your hands on this because you were contracted for the the console versions. You got your hand on this several months earlier. Talk about that. How soon... Uh, how, how much earlier did you get it, and what was that like? You got the game, and where did you go from there? So, so, so basically, what had happened was, um, you know, we were doing we we had had exclusive rights to get first dibs on all of Midway's arcade games. So, uh, you know, I guess it's probably about two, two or three months before the arcade release. <laughs> they. They basically plopped the game in front of my cubicle and said, yeah, this is another game that they're doing. You know, what do you think? So, you know, I, I you know, at first I was kind of hesitant to play it. You know, I was working on a bunch of other projects at the time. So, uh, you know, when I got time, uh, I noticed, like, the people in the marketing department coming down. And, you know, finally, you know, I was like, all right, let me see what this is. And I see, you know. Point blank, you know, people getting blood splattered all over the place. You know, my initial reaction, uh, Street Fighter wannabe. You know, and so, but then I sat with it, and my boss said, you know, what do you think? And I said, absolutely, we got to do this. You know, we, uh, we, we had the ver version that we got was a beta, so there was no reptile yet. There was no, uh, I mean, all the characters were still intact. But it was, it was buggy. And I just said, listen, it plays great. At this time, nobody even knew the concept of a fatality. How many months in advance did you guys get the first version of the arcade cabinet? Because it wasn't even out in arcade yet when you actually got the cabinet, correct? Pro probably about three months early. Two, two three months early. Okay, and there was no reptile. All the fatalities were in the gamer, but there was no reptile. None of that, right? No, no just... reptile yet. Yeah, reptile was a concept that I guess Boone put in later down the road. Um, and fatality wise, uh, were they there? Probably. I never, you know, to be honest, I never tried because back then I didn't know. You know, at the time, unless you were on the pit, you know, the only thing you did is uppercut at the guy. Okay, so you got the the arcade cabinet. You guys get contracted to to make the console versions of the game. Uh, now, obviously, this was the beta. Mortal Kombat in general in the arcade, every every arcade Mortal Kombat went through several revisions. Uh, did they send you all the revisions? How frequently did yes. you get them, etc.? Well, we got the revisions up to let me shout healthy up to uh, three point oh. Basically, they would they would ship us the ROMs, and we had you know they shipped us. They were really cool to us. I ain't gonna lie. They would ship us the ROMs with directions. You know, put this ROM in here, this ROM in here. You know, so we were upgrading it as it was getting updated. Now, when it comes to secrets, you know, they've in the arcade, they've, things are always very secretive, uh, and this is because 
you know, when you when you make games for arcades, it's different than when you make them for consoles. When you make them for arcades, the owner's paying. Uh, what did you say? Uh, an MK1 co- uh, arcade cabinet went for about like fifteen hundred. An MK1 cabinet went for about three, about between three and four grand. Okay, so if, if an arcade owner buys, let's say, two of these, that's between six and eight grand they're spending, right? That's ten grand that he's got to make back before he makes a profit. And obviously, if these secrets come out, if they just you know put these secrets out there. It's less incentive for players to pump coins in the machine, which is less money the arcade makes, which is if they don't make their money back or at least turn a substantial profit, they're less than likely to go ahead and buy more machines from the same company. So secrets were a big deal. But yes. with you guys doing the console version, you they, they gave you Reptile all the secrets, right? So you guys knew all this over at Acclaim? No. No. They didn't give us it. For MK1, they gave us nothing. We were on a wind and a prayer, basically. What about Reptile? Was he in the console versions? Yeah. Yeah, he's in there. How, what did how, how did you find out about that? I mean, did, did, did finally they, they tell you? or? I, if I remember correctly, I think one day Ed had said to me, like, and did you find Reptile? Because there were appearances, Reptile appearances. Now, nobody knew at the time, you know, what the requirements were, you know, because it didn't. The, the original version, there was a glitch. The original version that they, they put him in, there was a glitch where he didn't, uh, he didn't do any appearances. But something would fly by the moon. Um, and, then, and then there was also a version of it where, you know... It, it, what would, he didn't even appear, you know, nothing would fly by the moon after, I think it was, I want to say 30 matches. After 30, after 30 pit appearances, something, the silhouette will fly by. You know, and eventually, you know, and it's funny because originally, you know, when I, when I was, when I was playing pretty hard, I never, I always thought, that certain fatalities you couldn't get the, to reptile, you know, like forward, forward, back, back, block with Sonya's fatality. Well, you can't hit block. That's one of the requirements. For those that don't get... know at home, we didn't play. Tell us the conditions to get reptile. You had to get a double flawless without block, and a silhouette had to fly by the moon. This was the same on the console? The yes. Same. Now, they sent the source code, right? So it was in the source code. Who, who gets the source code? Who handles that? How does that go? That went to uh, Sculptured and Probe because they were the ones that are actually modifying the code or converting the code to uh, Super Nintendo and Genesis. Uh, let's talk about that. So they, you guys get the contract. You're playing the arcade version of the game. Um, obviously, you have to do this because there's no console version for you to play. You have to convert it to console. So while yeah. these companies are working on the game, you've you guys got to be doing stuff as well. So your only point of reference is the arcade version at this time. Uh, so how did that go? So Probe handled the Sega Genesis side of things and Sculptured Software handled the Super Nintendo side of things. Yes. Uh, so uh, talk me through that. So they were the programmers, and they would on the acclaim end. So basically, we, you guys were the designers. How did that work? We basically, you know, they would come, they would program it, and we'd be the ones that come back to them and say, "This has got to be more realistic." Um, a lot of more of the uh, conceptual. I mean, they also had, you know, it wasn't just us. They had guys there, you know, Jeff Peters, who was over at Sculpture, was, you know, a, a gamer. So, it, you know, after, you know, if he saw something and said, well, I want to keep it like this or I want to keep it like this, you know, we would have conversations and, you know, system limitations sometimes, you know, you would want to get as many frames as you can. But again, you're trying to squeeze two gallons of water into a gallon jug. So things have to get lost. You know, so. A lot of it was they would program, and old school days, 
you know, I don't remember. I believe it, it could have been an IS. It wasn't an ISD. It was definitely DSL at the time. And, uh, you know, we would, we would connect to each other via, you know, 56K modems. And we'd have to download the ROMs, burn the ROMs, you know, put them in the carts, play it through, see what's best up, compile lists, and send them the list. They would go through the lists, and then, you know, the next day, we'd be downloading another one. How long you know, did a ROM take to download on a 56? Was it 28K or 56? I think it was 56 for the DSL. Uh, how, how long did one of these ROMs take to download on a 56K modem? Uh, probably close to two, maybe three hours. All right, so when you're making, then, making these games, uh, what did you say, two to three hours? So you didn't use ISDN? To, so DSL, okay, so this is 1992, which is the year. And there was DSL around then. You said DSL was 56K? But they both ISDN 56K as well. Okay, so it took you about two to three hours to download a ROM. Uh, and, then it, and then it would take, and then it would take to burn the EPROMs took like another hour two hours so round about five hours from five they sent it to from, you from, for from, you to be able to get it. it to send to plugging it into a console five hours so a whole business day was gone just just to get the version of the game pretty much yes. okay so for those that don't know uh, back then the video game industry was going through quite uh, a a weird situation in which, um, so Nintendo had a strict policy. Sega Genesis, I guess they didn't care. Jimmy, they were just Sega, like, whatever. Sega, Sega, Sega was more, hey, if, it, if they don't come knocking on our door, let it rock. But Nintendo had a, a policy, uh, no blood, etc. What was the policy, the guidelines they gave you for Mortal Kombat 1? Right from the onset. Their, their main the main thing was very simple no blood under no circumstances and no decapitations that was the only two that they gave us from the onset now as time went on it evolved but you know basically at that point from day one we knew that we weren't getting the blood so we tweaked it we put crystals in we put sweat in we tried to make it purpler. You know, we, we, we tried everything around it, and Nintendo just said, no, 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 no. They had to go with sweat. The sweat was the only thing you could go so basically with. Basically, was sweat was the only one they went with. The sweat. Okay, so, but even though the Super Nintendo, you couldn't have any blood or decapitations, you still needed fatalities, right? So whose job was it to come up with? You guys were the, 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 on the designer end, sculpture, probe etc they pretty much you guys designed it and they you guys said do this and they they programmed it who came up with the super nintendo version of the fatalities it was me all right so uh, which fatalities did you come up with which characters and, and what were the fatals the original raiden which was the fry to electric dust instead of the head popping the sub-zero one which was originally uh, and they made us take it out and tweak it, was, you know, and again, Raiden's fatality, you know, the artist that did the fatal was over at Sculpture. And when he drew it out, it takes a while. You know, time's ticking, and now we're going, oh, shoot, you know, it took so much just to do this one fatality. So my boss basically said, we got to speed it up. So... You know, my original fatality was the deep freeze, and he was going to smack you with the backhand, which is, all it was was the high punch in close move. It wasn't like a new animation. Yeah, it was the it. same. It was in close high punch. For those that don't know, Mortal Kombat, the arcade classics, and not so not three, but in in, in one and two. Uh, you would have these, because 3 just had combo attacks in close, so whatever your attacks were would turn into combo attacks at close range. But in 1 and 2, you could do these different, like, special in close moves. And Sub Zero and MK1 at point blank range would have, like, a, a backhand smack. But the best one was Kano, he'd hit you with his head, give you a headbutt, and you would hear that ding. 
The only sound that was only used one time in the game, it was the sound of Kano's metal hitting somebody in close. So the original Sub Zero Super Nintendo Fatality wasn't the the wasn't what we got in the console version originally. No, basically what happened is when he smashed the head, the 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 ice would turn a purple to kind of represent that blood actually is coming down, and they said no. I wanted to, t- I w- but basically what I wanted is them to make like an ice sculpture that shattered and bled, but they said no to that, so it just wound up being. Backhand and you shatter. All right, and so then, uh, Sub-Zero's was the spine rip in the arcade, right? And that obviously was no good. It was a decapitation. Yeah, yeah. So it turned into the the, the the smack and the shatter. Johnny Cage had the decapitation uppercut. What did you do with that? All right, so for, the, for Johnny Cage, I said, let's do a shadow kick. And I forgot something. I don't know. I don't remember what inspired me. One of the Kung Fu theater thing movies inspired me. I said, I want him to kick you in the stomach, his foot go through you, and knock all your guts out your back. Not at decapitation, so it should be good. Of course, they made us take out the guts. I didn't, and I totally had forgotten about that, you know, as time went on, because the version that I have has the guts back. But there was no blood in that. It was just the guts. Uh, no, it was the, just the... It was just shadow kick as hard as he could to your to your stomach to knock out your gut through your back. So basically, your lungs and your liver fall out the back. So you changed Johnny Cage, Raiden, and Sub Zero. Kano, like some fatalities, like Scorpion and Sonya, was the, the kiss, the burn, the kiss of death, the burning kiss, yeah. and, and and the Hellfire. That yeah, those were fine. There was no blood. That was fine. Luke Hanks was obviously fine. It was just a cartwheel uppercut. For those that don't know, the cartwheel uppercut in Mortal Kombat 1, the screen not going black, that was a bug. Uh, but because he was, you know, uh, what was Luke Kane? White, White Lotus? Was that him? White Lotus. White yeah. Lotus. He was supposed to be, you know, a monk. They figured, you know what? Okay, he doesn't actually fatality you technically and, and the screen doesn't go black. So they kept the bug. But the screen not going black for Luke Kane was a bug. I don't know. Did it not go black on the Super Nintendo or Genesis or, or did it go to black? Didn't stay white. I see. That was at that point it stayed. All right, so pretty much the only three you had to change was those three. Now Kano had a fatality that wasn't a decapitation, and you took the blood out, which is when he ripped the heart out. So when his heart ripped, you guys kept that in the game. No, what had happened was, uh, you know, so you know, Mortal Monday. You know, in order to get things out for Mortal Monday. The game had to be submitted to Nintendo by a certain date. If it wasn't if it wasn't approved by that date, when we go to mass production, it wouldn't have come out on Mortal Monday. It would have been late, and all the money we spent on advertising and doing everything would have been shot. So we send it in for final approval, and Nintendo comes back that day. Yeah, we got a problem. And, you know, my boss said, you know, what's up? And they said, well, first thing is you got to take out the gut stuff for Johnny Cage. And, yeah, Kano's heart fatality can't be in there either. So now, you know, we're panicking. You know, we we basically, this is the day. If we miss this day, it is not going to be Mortal Monday. So, you know, my boss's answer was simple. Can't come up with none. Remove the heart. Remove the guts. So if anyone ever played the Super Nintendo version, when Kano does the heart rip, he does all the animations of the actual heart rip, but his hand is empty. There's no heart in it. So I used to tell everybody he gave you a purple nurple with death. So the reason why there was nothing in his hand, and I've always wondered this, like, what is that? Was he had the heart, it didn't beat, it didn't bleed, but Nintendo said, that's still too much. Yep. So you were in a crunch for time, so you said just, it's gone. He just pulls nothing out? Gotta, gotta take it out. We had, we had no time to give him a new, and, you know, we you know we had, had already concepts. Of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if he burnt them, if he did this? Because we didn't anticipate, you know, once they, once they said these fatalities need to come out, of course, in my head, I started creating fatalities, new ones for everybody in my head. 
You know, so I said, oh, it would have been cool to put the laser in and it shoots him a laser out the eye. Um, and you could just do the fire animation. But again, we had no time. No time. Yeah. So basically, we had, we had removed them. We put like three or four hours of testing in. And, you know, by this time, it's like 10 o'clock at night. You know, again, back then, there was no emails. There were no you know, fast, high-speed fucking connections that you can just, you know, upload it to somebody. So in New York, the local locations for, like, FedEx, which is how we usually shipped everything, closed at 8 o'clock. Okay, so hold on a minute. So you got... You sent the... the, You thought you were done. You sent the game off to Nintendo in Seattle... And it had the, the shadow kick with the guts and still had the heart rip, etc. They get back to you when? A few days after that? That day, within hours from them getting it. So you're so the, you thought so you're at the deadline already and you thought we're done, we, we barely we're made like, deadline. We're all celebrating. So that was at the deadline you sent the final version or what you thought would be the final version. Then they get back to you and they say, We got a problem, this can't be released. I think, it, to be honest, I think it was the day before. They said, we sent it with a day to spare. And they had played it and gotten back to us that day and said, no. Now we literally had one day to clean it up and get it out. That was the day. You know, so we had told the programmers at Sculpt- uh, at, that Sculpture, like, it's just got to go. We got to get it because you got to remember, like the time frame to to burning the ROMs and testing them. You know, like we were, we were all sitting with itchy trigger trigger fingers, you know, waiting for the ROM to come across. Like literally, you know how like you know back in the day, you would look to download a movie or something, and you'd be like, "Come on!" And it would stop it like 10k and just lock up for a few minutes. You're like, "Come on!" Yeah, yep. Like we were that antsy to get it out because once we got it, then we had to burn it. Then we had to test it to make sure they didn't mess anything else up, which in that case they did. Okay, so before uh, we get to what messed up, so what happens is you got the game. I mean, now you downloaded all the ROMs, right? Then you, you changed it. So you okay? All right, so I got you. So you had to change what you had to change. Then you had to convert it from whatever into like the actual ROMs, and then test it. So, okay, you got rid of the Johnny... The Shadow Kick still stayed, but there was no guts. Kano, the heart was invisible. And I think you were telling me earlier privately that you noticed that in doing this, something got messed up in the Super Nintendo version. What happened? The, the One of the signature things of Mortal Kombat to me is Johnny Cage, Raiden, and Kano all share the same animation for a jump punch. Um, and it allowed you to cheat through the whole game where you could literally just repeat this move and win every round, double flawless, no problem. And it wasn't working no more. And so I you're noticed talking about the instant jump forward punch. Yes. Okay. And then I started to notice it felt watered down, like the reaction time, you know, the reaction of hitting up on a controller. Just that almost, move or the no, inputs the whole, in general? All inputs in general. So when you would hit up, you know, you would hit up and you would go one up and he's up in the air. Now you would hit up and it was one, two and a half. And they would and it would react. It was the lag. Basically it was lag. Lag did you before online this? lag. That day. So you were testing so okay, you changed you changed the fatals. Uh and then you noticed something didn't feel right. But it didn't get fixed. Why? Can't because it had to go. Mortal Monday. <laughs> so you had to Mortal send Mo- it out. That you guys were already on borrowed time. You know, if we didn't get it out, it was Mortal Monday was not going to happen. Okay, so you told me an interesting story, and I want people to hear this. So today, when you guys hear FedEx, people today in 2020 are like, "Well, go to the FedEx Kinkos. They're open 24 hours a day in most places." Problem solved. But in 1992, life was not so simple. So take me through this. You had to get it to the FedEx. All right. So 
FedEx, so FedEx, we knew FedEx on Long Island was closed. They closed 8 o'clock. Boom, done. Even if we got it there at 7, it didn't matter. Because we were, we were on 24 hours, and it was not. If we got it there at 8 o'clock at night, it was not going to get there in time. It might get, get there, you know, to Washington 6, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night. Which, at that point, Nintendo's going to be like, yeah, now nah, uh, we're going to have to, we didn't get to it. We're still testing it. You know, so we said, all right, let's go to the Manhattan location, which is about a, an hour ride, because they closed at midnight. That was like the main hub for the East Coast. We're still testing it 11 o'clock at night. Finally, my boss said, listen, we got no choice. Let's go to the airport. And buy this thing a ticket. And put it on a plane to Washington. Because we got to get it there today. And they bought the, they, them and, and, and one of the other guys that worked. Took it with them. And bought a counter-to-counter ticket for it. And put it on a plane. And escorted it. Wait a minute. You know, Wait, let me get this straight. Hold on a minute. You bought the game a plane ticket. A ticket. Yes. You bought the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat 1 a ticket to Washington. Right. Yep. Yep. And then one of the, the producers said, well, you know, because the, the producer, this guy Rob Lingang, he, uh, he was from Washington. He worked for Nintendo. So, you know, he said, well, hey, isn't it better if I go? Because God forbid... This thing gets lost at the airport, which has happened to tons of people's stuff before. So he personally went with it to Nintendo. So the game got a plane ticket. Okay, so game gets a plane ticket. If it didn't get there on time, Mortal Monday is gone. For those who don't know, Mortal Monday... You can go to YouTube and Google, you know, Mortal Monday, Mortal Kombat commercial with the guys in the street going Mortal Kombat. Was that an acclaim? That was an acclaim, right? Whose idea was that? Was that on your end in, in New York? I, came up with I, that yeah, I, I used to shit, you know. I mean, I had input in that. Um, I, I'll never forget two great guys. Uh, Bob Pisunko and Steve Lux were our top marketing guys. And, you know, they would always come to me, you know, like, and that's the thing. They would always come to me and like, hey, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about how, and they had mentioned, you know, what about this, you know, if we get a bunch of people, you know, and this one guy, and I, I said, yeah, we, you know, that fucking be cool, you know, have them come down like, I don't know, like New York City screaming. And they're like, yeah, and they wound up getting a spot that that location is down by Wall Street where they shoot that commercial. And, uh, and, and, and basically, uh, yeah, it wouldn't have happened had it not, you know, gotten there, but man, it's, it, it was rough for me because even when it went out and we finally got the approval because of that bug, that bug bothered me. Bug always bothered The Genesis version was much simpler. So Sculpture Software programmed the Super Nintendo version. On the Sega side, it was done by Probe. There was no restrictions at all, right? On the Sega side? Yeah, Sega side, there was no restrictions. But at the time, Senator Lieberman from, Ca- uh, from Connecticut started his campaign on the violence in video games. Which, ironically, I, you know, for a gamer, I can't lie. I kind of agree with him to a degree. Um, so what my boss had said is, why don't we, you know, at the end of the day, let's give the illusion that we even give a shit. And it, it's basically what happened. And, you know, so we, we sent the game out with no blood in it as well. The Genesis and then the code. No blood. Yes. Okay. But we put, the, but we put a code in. What now, was the code? At A-B-A-C-A-B-B. Abacab. Whose idea was that? That was my idea. Um, what had happened was back in 93, uh, and 92, both, you know, I wasn't a big music guy, but the guys, 
the other guys that worked there, four of the guys that worked there were in a band. And, you know, they were into all the new up-and-coming music. So at the time, the flavors of the month were, I'll never forget it, Nirvana, Nevermind, you know, was a hot band that's up-and-coming. U2 just came out with a new album. And I'm in my cube listening to the band Genesis. You know, Mr. Phil Collins. Phil I, was, Collins I mean, I love, yeah. you know, and, you know, my boss had mentioned to me about a code. You know, and I, and he had us all trying to think of something, you know, witty. And, and I'm looking at the album I'm listening to. And it, it's, it's not a phenomenal song. And the name of the song is Abacab. And I'm looking at it. And I'm looking at the Genesis controller. And I'm like. I could spell this out. That's pretty cool. And I said to my boss, I go, wait, put in, put the code as Abicab. And even my boss looked at me like, huh? I said, nobody's going to ever figure this out. I said, and what's ironic about it is it's for the Sega Genesis. The code is performed by the band Genesis. And it's, and it, and it falls out perfect on the controller. He loved Put it in, make it so. Okay, done. Little did I know, <laughs> come mortal Monday, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we're out there releasing the code. I thought it was going to be a secret. Didn't last, didn't last, the code didn't last an hour. So the arcade version was launched October 8th, 1992. Mortal Monday was September 13th, 1993. September 13th, 1993. So right around 11 months, it was released for SNES, Genesis, Game Boy, and Game Gear on that day. Probe does the Genesis, uh, the Sega side of things, a Genesis, Game Gear. Sculpture does SNES, the Nintendo side of things. The... Super Nintendo already had by default the uh, a six button controller. Genesis yes. sold separately a six button controller, but it was initially launched with a three button. So if you bought a Sega Genesis in the store, you had a three button controller. They actually had to go out and purchase a six button. So by default, you guys had to make sure that the Genesis version could work with the three button, right? Because yes. there's no guarantee they had a six button. How did that work out? What did you guys do with that? Uh. I think it start was block um, for I think your two kicks were B and C and your punches were I want to I want to say the A button but if you held back it would be a low punch or a high punch I can't remember off the top of my head but it was a wacky setup that made the game not feel good and my biggest tweak about it was knowing you could do the game on the Genesis with, because it played better. It didn't really matter to me as far as the punches went. And I remember going through it because you had the, as long as you had a high punch or a low punch, you had the hot punch. So you could always muscle your way through the game. And then with the six button, it, it gave us the ability to actually map it out where it was, you know, close to feeling right besides the sega genesis game boy game gear snes it was also released on amiga ms dos sega cd and the sega master system which uh, you, you work on any of these or yeah, every one of them best version of mk1 was what ms dos i think dos dos was probably the closest Sega but you know what? Sega CD was dots. Genesis, everything, but it had the arcade soundtrack, correct? And we put the commercial in. The commercial was in the Sega CD version. Yeah. So they could view the commercial. That's quite interesting. Amiga, not many people are familiar with. I think almost everybody that's listening will have heard of <laughs> Sega CD or the original Sega Master System, Super Nintendo Genesis, etc. cetera. Uh, Amiga was, was what? What was the Amiga? Amiga was like a very ham radio, CB radio-esque. It was uh, big in Europe. 
you know, it was big in Europe. Not many people here really were big with the Amiga, you know, comparing it. But it was like a PC, but not as powerful. I'm surprised you made this for the Master System at all. Listen, they, uh, you know, Acclaim was notorious. If, if, if it had a microprocessor in it, we tried to put the games on it. Game Boy is proof of that, I think. That, was, that couldn't yeah. have been easy to do. The Game Boy version, what was the... I mean, like, how did you guys get that even to work? The Game Boy version is infamous for, like... That was definitely was a rough version to play. It was horrible, and it was like... You know, a lot of people love to get... You know, everybody says, oh, I want to get a job making games. You know what? The guys now have it easy. Because, I mean, think about it. So... I'm working on the Super Nintendo. I'm working on the Genesis. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on the Game Gear, which Game wasn't Gear that was big. Game Gear was 8-bit. It was basically like having a Nintendo or, or Sega yeah, Master it wasn't as horrible. And then you get Game Boy. And you're like, you know, you got to test shit on this. Like, you know, I keep t I tell people all the time, working in the game industry is not playing a game like you play at home. It's a job now. You sit on a Game Boy game of Mortal Kombat for two weeks straight, you're going to hate it. Because now you find, you find all the inconsistencies. You find the system limitations. I mean, you just find every and, and by the time you get done with it, you're just thanking God it's gone. Yeah, I mean, definitely at that point, you were heavily limited by technology. More so than anyone today, that's for yeah. sure. Technology. We had six, six characters total, I think, what it was. So the game gets released. At this point, you're just James Fink, right? You're, just, you're working at Acclaim. Let's go into how you got the name James MK. Like, how, how did that come about? You didn't name yourself, right? I mean, so how, how no. did that happen? Yeah. So, so basically what had happened was, while we were working on the game... Uh, you know, again, I have got, and I and I tell people all the time, there's natural ability, and then there's actual work ethic. I was playing Mortal Kombat one, fifteen to sixteen, maybe twenty hours a day, every day. When the game first got put by my cubicle. Like I said, all the marketing and sales guys and all the other guys that worked at Acclaim would come down and play. And all I ever heard in my head, finish them, finish them, finish them. And I was working on other titles at the time. And, uh, you know, and I got annoyed. So, you know, at the time I was dating a girl and I, I subjected her to some torment. I would bring her to work to test things on the, on the arcade version with me. And I would play this game non-stop and it got to the point once i figured out an anti-air punch perfecting it you know even my my girlfriend or she was my fiance at the time um because of playing me and me running her through the gauntlet of shit for 16 hours eventually she was going to the arcade and whooping top players so let's get into so, that. You mentioned anti-air punch. Mortal Kombat 1 did something that really wasn't being done too much in fighting games. Certainly not in Street Fighter. In Street Fighter, when somebody was airborne, they were pretty much immune, right? You couldn't hit them out of the air. Well, if correct. they jumped in, once, they, once you hit them into a juggled state, you then could when you again. Hit, if you hit them into... If you hit them, for example, Ryu and, and Ken are throwing fireballs. One jumps and lands on the fireball. That's it. He falls. And if you try to hit him, the move goes through him, right? You can't juggle him. Mortal Kombat 1, I don't believe it was the first game that did this, but it certainly was the most influential in, in making juggles a staple in fighting games today. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that. But Mortal you know, Kombat it, was kind of a different... You had two different games. So you had Street Fighter. They didn't use the block button. It was back to block. I mean, they kind of had a, a two-in-one combo system. Mortal Kombat didn't even have cancels, didn't have two-in-ones. It was juggle-based, correct? So on the ground, 
there was no real combos grounded. You had to get somebody airborne to actually execute a combo at this time. Correct. And that, now, even when, it might have been the even, first game to do that, right? I mean, the, the first game, not to juggle, but that's the only way to combo is to juggle. Because MK1 yes. pre- if you look, predates look, Tekken, look at, Virtua Fighter. It, it predates all these other games. So it was, while it, it was a 2D game, it used a very 3D-like combo system even before 3D games became popular. Yeah, you could say that. You know, it. it, it what happened was, was, if you look at the moves of the players, you know, Scorpion Spear, you know, it brought you in for that limited amount of dizzy. Sub-Zero's freeze. A limited amount of time to freeze. Those were your basic, you know, from a standing position, those were really the only two moves that allowed you to do any type of combo. Straight up, you know, foot to foot, floor to floor. That's the only ones that would give you that 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 ability. Without that, you, know, you Kano, need to jump kick them or anti air them. Kano, right? Kano, no Kano had there. the knife and the ball. They hit you, they knocked you away. Liu Kang had the fireball and the flying kick. They hit you, they knocked you away. You know, Sonya's leg grab dropped you down, but, you know, eventually they came up with the loop. Um, yeah, the infinite leg grab. That was in the Super Nintendo version, was it? Or No. No, Sony's Lego of Infinite was arcade only then. It was did, yeah. did not make it to Super Nintendo. You guys took that out. And but, it was it's not that we took it out. <laughs> Thirty years later I'll say it's a false infinite. Because it can be stopped. But this it's a frame issue. It's a frame issue, and I've never gotten it down perfect, but I'm a hundred percent that the Sonya leg grab in Infinite and MK one is not a true infinite. You know, but if you look at the other characters, all their moves, Raiden, electricity popped you back. Superman fly pushed you across the screen. There was no combos off of the initial special moves besides the freeze and the spear. So without freeze and so spear, they, you either had to anti-air them or jump kick them to get a combo. Yes. Now you could jump kick Superman fly because that would pop you up. You know, but until the anti-air punch really started to catch on, the only that those you know, I would go into arcades and I'd see guys doing one and two hit combos. That's why a lot of these younger guys see this game. I mean, there's no combos. Something you interesting know? to Mortal Kombat One. I think this is the only MK this happens in. The characters in MK One do not auto face when you jump over them, right? Or am I remembering that right? They don't. You jump over somebody with a jump kick, your foot stays in the same direction it's going. And that stayed the same way on the Super Nintendo and Genesis version? That stayed that stayed true to the game. Uh, uh, only until MK2 did they do the cross-ups. That's interesting how they didn't uh, allow auto-facing in MK1. Uh, I don't think... The real, people the real question is, the real question is, and I think because... Um, they were trying to stay as realistic as possible. Um, why doesn't it do it anymore? <laughs> Everybody likes to cross up, which I like too. But the fact of the matter is, it's a move that physically makes no sense. True. And they were going for that realism. They had that those digitized graphics, etc. Yeah. So you're James Fink, and you became James MK, Jim MK Fink, or James MK, how they put you in the credits of the game or something? Or, or what, how so, Jeff, go? So, so basically, I got so good at the game that I became the guy to be inside the internal acclaim world and, you know, midway at the time. Uh, and Jeff Peters, when he put the credits in, he put Jim MK Fink. You know, and people thought it was Jim McFink because I'm Irish and I'm, I don't know, I just good at Mortal Kombat. And ever since then, I just, I, I guess I just rode with it. You so, know, so. Let's talk on that. So here you are playing MK. Now, here's where we get more to the competitive side. You know, you're playing MK. You just mentioned you were pretty much considered the guy in Mortal Kombat. Even the Midway people knew who you were. The testers on the Midway side were. Mike Vinicor and Eddie Ferrier, and you yeah, finally wow. ran into them and got to play the Midway Testers at CES in the summer of... 19... Winter. 
the winter. Oh, wait. Summer, 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 summer. Summer Vegas. Of, of what year? 93? 93. So before so, it came out on the console, you got to, to sit down and play those guys at CES. For those that don't know, you guys today know about E3. Uh, E3 pretty much uh, became the gold standard. Uh, but before E3, you know, E3 uh, was been around for God knows how long. Before E3, though, there was CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. And we were just a piece of it. Yeah, and that was the that was the big deal. There was no E3 at that point. It was just a Consumer Electronics Show. That was the big thing. Sure. And yeah. in, at that point, you got to finally sit down and play. This is the first time you played the testers on the Midway end? First time I played the testers, first time I met Ed Boon. Okay, so you meet Ed Boon and the testers at uh, CES in the summer of 1993 at CES in Las Vegas. So you play the testers, you play Farrier, Venacore. What, what did you think of Ed Boon? Was Tobias there as well? And, and did you play the testers? And, and what, did, what was Ed Boon's reaction when you played those testers? Um, so, you know, again, they, you know, not that, and I hate it because it makes me sound a little too cocky. I was untouchable. And, and Vinicor, I remember Vinicor played me first. I bodied him like five or six games in a row, and he just walked off. Um, again, this was at the acclaimed party, you know, at CES. You know, after, after hours, uh, inve investors and, and potential buyers would come, and we'd, you know, basically booze them up. A lot of big wigs were there, basically. Yeah. And it so, was kind of like, yeah. hey, let's have our guy at acclaim play your guys at Midway and see what happens. And basically, Boone was like, let's see what you got. I hear about you. And I remember him looking at me. And after I beat them down, um, he looked at the producer, Rob Lingang, and said, wow, this guy's a game dick. <laughs> and, I, and Rob Lingang pulled me on the side. He's like, he's like, you're a game dick. That's what he said. I said, what? He says, you're so ar I was playing him one-handed. If you guys don't I mean, know Ed Boone, that sounds like something Ed Boone would say. If you guys never met him, for those that are listening, it, it, it sounds like something you say. So the one-handed thing you mentioned, a big rumor in the MK world is that you beat somebody one-handed. Was did that happen at the CES? I beat a from? lot of I beat a lot of people one-handed. Yeah, but but the and, law and, of it, and for the when record, it finally and happens. And for the record, you know, because again, oh, would you just use Raiden back back forward? No. No, I had shortcuts with Kano's ball. You know, it was technically like down towards to back was enough to kick off the, the, the roll. You know, I was doing buttons and combos with the, you know, I was doing, and it's funny because I can't do it now. You know, I was saying to myself one day, let me see. I used to do the hot punch one-handed. You know, I just... Again, and it's not because I was this amazing player. It's because I put so much time in. Like, you always get that one or two guys in the FGC that come up with their BS. I can count frames. No, you can't. Nobody can count frames visually. But I was, so, I was probably Neo, and I was that close to being able to count frames just because of the time and effort that I put into it. So I would literally be able to do all the moves one-handed and from that point on and, and it's funny because i thought you know looking back now that i'm older i thought like i was their their circus freak but there was a lot of people there was a lot of people that hated it because it, you know i looked you know looking back now i'd probably punch me you know here's a guy that's beating people one-handed, being, you know, drinking a beer in one hand and, and playing the game with another, you know. And after I had beat those two guys, um, you know, Boone was, you know, he's a game dick. And I, I accepted that. So there's a story um, about this, about at that CES in Joe Pesci. Tell everybody that story. So we were in our suite. And it was the Desert Inn. And at the time, 
they were filming uh, the movie Casino there. So, you know, Joe Pesci basically came in, just walked into the party. And, of course, the claim, you know, we didn't know who he was at the time. You know, I mean, he was a big actor, but, you know, and then when he did the whole, well, I'm Joe Pesci. And they were like, all right, we'll get out. It's a private party. <laughs> he stormed out pissed. You know, and then, uh, and then that same CES, Thor Ackerlin, who um, was the Nintendo, the reigning Nintendo world champ, used to walk around the CES with an entourage. You know, he was, he was, for then, you know, he was, he was that 1993 big rig esports. You know, he walked around with an entourage and he came in to play Mortal Kombat. And had a film crew, and they were filming it. And then I remember Boone. Boone actually told me, like, you should go play this guy. You know, all right, let me go play him. And I, again, I didn't one-handed him. I blew his back out. And he was pissed. Turned the cameras off, this, that, that. And then he came back the next night. We had another party. He came back, and I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I'm not playing you. You don't get a shot at the belt no more. So that's where I was a dick. I was like, nah. You got to beat you got to beat Vinicor and Eddie Feria to get a shot at the belt, and it, and I just never played him again. Something that you mentioned earlier that I find is interesting that uh, not many people know about. You mentioned Senator Lieberman. So when MK One was released in arcades, it didn't really get the kind of shine that people think originally. Like it had the fatals, it had the blood, it had the gore, and Mortal Kombat really powered American arcades. Street Fighter did as well, but MK kind of had the controversy to really kind of like bolster the fighting game scene. Yes. But Mortal Kombat 1 initially didn't get that kind of shine until it hit consoles, correct? And then, if I remember... I mean, it, 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 had, it, it had some small news reports. But it didn't get know, to it, like the Senate until the console launches. Um, well, yeah, pretty much. Um, because you know, arcades don't need a rate even today arcades don't have a no. rating system no when it came to the home systems you know and you know following up like a lot of the local I remember Chicago news always had stories about these guys you know in the Chicago diversions arcade and look at it and the kids were like oh my god I get to rip their heads off I think that was an initial fueling of it but when it came to the home system, and it's now available for every kid to get his hands on, that's when Lieberman really had to, uh, I guess, rein it in. Yeah, so for those that don't know, uh, there was no rating system initially. Sega had a rating system, but many people thought it wasn't very clear and kind of confusing. Uh, there were hearings done because parents were... The, the two games that spearheaded this were Mortal Kombat and the Sega CD game Night Trap. And basically, the government was like, you know, you either need to create your own rating system or we're going to police, what? we're going to do it for you, which is when ESRB and PEGI over in EU came around. But this is, MK1 wasn't released in these times. So parents were kind of like, what am I watching? This guy's punching his hat off. This guy's ripping his spine out. It was all over the news. These congressional hearings were, were, were really, really big. And this really kind of, you know, paved the way for MK2, right? I mean, this, this made Mortal Kombat bigger than, I think, any arcade fighting game in America. Street Fighter Worldwide was obviously the biggest arcade game. Uh, Street Fighter yeah. 2, uh, a championship edition. But Mortal Kombat in America became the king of most locales, correct? Yeah, it definitely. Once, once... You know, and again, you know, I always say, you know, whether I'm doing my show or something, controversy sells. And the minute government shined the spotlight on it, that's a wrap. Oh, that's bad? The government says that's not good? I want three of them. And of course, every rebellious teen was like, yeah, I'll play it. Sure, my parents hate it. Yeah, I love it. A lot of kids that got into Mortal Kombat didn't necessarily get into it in the arcade. The arcades, you had to pay money for every game. 
Yeah. The majority of people didn't have that luxury. You know, you had to get your parents to give you a ride to the mall. You know, it came out on Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis. It was much easier to buy it in the store. Most kids at that time were not arcade players. So the joystick wow. was kind of weird to them. The controller was, you know, they were a little more familiar on it. You did have people that played in the arcade, but a lot of people usually waited till it came out on the console. So the game was released on console September 13th, 1993, uh, 11 months after the arcade launch for SNES, Genesis, Game Boy, Game Gear. Now, at this time, there were no... The internet isn't what it is today, obviously. I, I don't even want to say it was prehistoric. It was basically pre-prehistoric. Uh, most people didn't even have a PC. If you did, it certainly didn't have internet access in, in most cases. So while there was... And even if you did... There was no centralized location, but this is when the MKIRC came about, right? So let's go into that. So there's no real centralized message board. So if you're going to try to arrange meetups with people, you had to go into uh, Pound MK on IRC. Talk well, about before, those days. Before IRC, you know, there was a guy, and I, and I, I want to say it was Rat. He was like the FAQ compiler. He was the guy, all those FAQs that people would go out and buy, he was the guy that compiled it and made it in the first place. You know, and, and what wound up happening was he, uh, you know, he would go to news groups. You know, so news groups, so news groups were basically, uh, what a second, what is this guy doing? Uh, so, no, so news groups were basically th your way of getting around. You know, you would have to tell net to a news group, alt.mk, alt.games.mk. You know, there was one for Street Fighter, one for that, which is basically the closest we had to compiling stuff. You know, you would get super geeks who could afford a computer back then that, would go in there and say, hey, I've seen somebody do forward, forward, back for whatever, Raiden's Fatality, and they would put it up there. Other people would try, and Rat was the guy that compiled these FAQs. After that, as, as the internet started to evolve, you know, the original IRC was there. It was an a, a internet relay chat system, you know, and you would have to tell that to that too. And then a guy came out from Europe, I think from England, MIRC, which was like uh, the first version of like, I guess, uh, a uh, with an actual GUI to it versus, you know, actually having to type out in DOS and fucking Unix to get the places. So IRC came about and channel pound MK. Now we don't have to go to news groups to drop stuff. We could all talk live. And at the time, you know, there, there was always wars. You know, everybody wanted to be, you know, because you could be operator status and be the guy that runs the, you know, everybody wanted to run the, the channel. Um, the way you ran channels, though, is you would put a bot in there. You know, so bots were around even back then. And you would put the bot in and, you know, you set it up with a password and lock it in and, you know, you could set the rights to who could talk. And that's how a lot of the wars, you know, I like to call them the clone wars. What are these of, wars? What do you mean? Are these like, uh, you guys that meet up and play for money, etc.? No. What are we, these wars? No, not yet. Not yet. We shit talk each other, of course. You know, we were internet tough guys. Oh, don't make me come to Chicago and whoop your guys' asses. You know, and oh yeah, don't make me go to Florida or to California. Um... So as it evolved, you know, we would take over the rooms and then we'd flood, you know, it was called flooding because basically IRC is comprised of a couple of hundred servers throughout the world. And if you flood the server or DDoS, as you call it now, it would split IRC in half. So when it split, you would make another room, pound MK. And eventually, the servers would catch up again, and it would put it all together, and it would buy it would it would lock one of those rooms up because you couldn't make duplicate rooms, just like you couldn't make duplicate names, you know. So 
one of these guys had turned around and they flooded the channel. And, you know, again, we were always talking smack to each other. And they flooded it. And then they put in their, their bot. And they named their bot James MK with one S. So by doing that, my name, James MK, was gone forever. So I changed it to two S's, and that's why I got the two S's to this day. The name James MK, so it's J-E-M-E-S-S-M-K. So yeah, I tell him super and, stud, but reality is it's because some guy flooded the channel, flooded made the channel. a bot with my name, and I could never get it back. All right, so MK1's done. It's out. Um... This is kind of interesting here. The turnaround's really, really fast. So Mortal Kombat 1 is officially released on October 8th, 1992. Mortal Kombat 2 is then released eight and a half months later in arcades. So MK1 comes out in arcades. It was a big deal, but certainly the Senate hearings made it a huge deal after the console release. So the console launch seriously got everyone interested in Mortal Kombat. I would say however many people were interested in the game in its initial arcade law launch, the console versions increased that tenfold. So when MK2 comes out eight and a half months later, uh, keep in mind, MK2 was launched in the arcades before the console version of MK1 initially. Uh, and... It's still, a, it was picking up, but once the Mortal Kombat and Mortal Monday and the Lieberman hearings, etc., and kids found out about this Mortal Kombat game, they go to the arcades and they see Mortal Kombat 2, uh, it was a huge deal. So certainly the console version increased the interest in Mortal Kombat tenfold. I know a yes. lot of people, when they found out about Mortal Kombat 1, went to the arcade to play it, only to find out that Mortal Kombat 2 was already out. Now, when MK2 came out, Midway would release pretty much a, a public beta, right? The initial version was, was a beta of the game. It was missing a lot of the content, some of the fatals. I remember in the initial beta, Sub-Zero's double fatality, when he would uppercut you, the upper body would just disappear. Uh, when he would freeze you, it wouldn't even shatter. So there were certainly missing animations, etc. But they put the beta out there. Special moves got changed, commands got changed, etc., uh, what's interesting to me is that uh, so people are, are more and more people are going to the arcade to try to play this uh, Mortal Kombat game, but the turnaround's really really fast. So the, the con so while you're still working on the console version to make Mortal Monday, the arcade version is out. How soon after you finally wrapped up the console version of MK1 did you get a cabinet an arcade version of MK2? Again, after we wrapped up, maybe, I want to say, let me see, let me see, let me see, maybe four months, five months. Again, we got it about three months after, after it's released, three months before it's released, three, four months. Probably about three months, I think. So it was, it would, it would have had to have been, when was it, when was the arcade released again? Uh, the arcade release was June 25th, 1993. The console version of MK1 didn't come out till September 13th. So the console version came out. Uh, so we got, we probably, we probably got the arcade cabinet for that in April. Yeah, I would think about April we got it. Because we definitely had it before it got released because there was no going to an arcade. I remember that. You so, know, because while again, you were still working were, on MK1, before the MK1 launch, you had one of the early versions of MK2. No, 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 no. Because we released September, uh, t t September. Oh, so you got an April 94. Yeah. Okay, so you got a more polished version of Mortal Kombat 2. Uh, they didn't give you the, 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 the beta beta of the game. No, 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 no. I don't think we got the beta for that one. I think we got the 1.0. Something that's interesting, um, and Ed Boon has trolled about this even in the MK4 days, was a game that was known as MK Nitro. Ed Boon used to have 
a website called noobsybot.com in the late 90s for those that don't know. On this site, noobsybot.com, Ed Boon teased that they would make a game called Mortal Kombat Nitro, and it was a troll. However, Mortal Kombat Nitro was actually a real thing, and this came from you, uh, where... Well, take us through it. Before, during, they were working on MK2, but you hadn't realized it yet. And you came yeah. up with this idea for MK Nitro. What was the idea? How did you come up with the name, et cetera? All right. So basically, when we finished MK1, and I wasn't happy, you know, because, like I said, the gameplay fell short on the Super Nintendo. Uh, so I, I told my boss, you know, Street Fighter does it. Why can't we? I said, Street Fighter's got Turbo. I got this idea for Mortal Kombat Nitro. I said, Nitro's better than Turbo. And, you know, he said, you know, well, tell me about it. And I said, I'll put a, a presentation together. I started going through things, what I would want to see. Uh, had a friend of mine who, that worked there who was an artist to do new concepts for artwork for the characters. Um, and basically, it was I wanted to fix what was broken in MK1. Um, I guess it could have been considered a, a patch that you would have bought, you would have to buy. Um, and, you know, I had things in there. Everybody had uh, new fatalities. Um, Reptile Shang Tsung, Goro would be playable. Um, the, so they were the actually like, you could select them on the character select screen. Yes. Okay. Um, the concept that I was going with is, you know, one of the things I didn't like, you know, about Mortal Kombat, and to this day, too, um, because there wasn't a story mode, you know, you're, you would go through the arcade ladder and you get, you know, Raiden got pissed, blew up the world, the end, have a nice day. That was the finite story. I said, well, why does Kano got to be bad? Why does, you know, Sonya got to be good? And I came up with a concept that, that basically said, you're going up a ladder, but based on the decisions of who and who you don't kill will make your character slowly evolve into a bad character or a good character. So if Sonya, if Sonya goes through the whole game, doesn't kill anybody, but kills, you know, Kano, she'll get her good ending. But if she goes through there and starts whacking off Liu Kang and Johnny Cage, it's going to alter the ending. And what you're going to notice that's going to start happening is, you know, when you fight in the, the original temple field with the statue of Goro, it's, it's daytime. But when you start taking the path of bad, those backgrounds would be nighttime. So like when the screen would darken on a fatality, everything around you starts to darken. Speaking um, of fatalities, you, know, you also put in not just fatalities for the reptile Shang Tsung and Goro. You put in a s second fatalities for the, the entire cast, right? Yeah, everybody in the cast had second fatalities. And you guys were working on this, and then the project got canceled. Why? Because we found out, you know, we had presented it to Midway, and you know they said no. You know, unfortunately, we're working on MK two right now, and we thought they they felt it would interfere with their sales somehow. I don't know how, but and it was a fast turnaround. I mean, the game came out. Yeah. Mortal Kombat Two came out eight and a half months in the arcades after MK One. So not even nine months after MK One hits arcades for the first time. Less than nine months later, boom, MK Two is out. So it was which, really fast turnaround. Which is ironic. Which is, which is ironic because, and again, no jabs at nobody, but. A team of eight guys bang out a game that fast, but a team of 200 guys get clusterfucked and it becomes two, three-year projects. You know, it's, it's just well, the it's weird. Well, obviously more advanced today than they were. Yeah, they're more advanced, but, you know, my point is it's like, you know, I always felt smaller teams are better. You know, too many people pissing in the pot always screw something up. Yeah, but like I said, the game's technology is, 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 is a lot... Uh... Than. So MK Nitro scrapped. However, 
Word on the street is you actually have the Nitro ROMs and you're currently working on completing the Nitro ROMs for the Super NES version of the game. Is this true? I am contemplating it. Um, I have the ROMs still. Um, I've been talking to people. Uh, I don't want to release it. I'm very adamant about, you know, kind of preserving some of the MK slash my history. And... You know, the other issue is, you know, if I gave you the ROMs to download and you called me up and said, ah, oh, man, something happened, I'd be pissed at you. That's why I t I'm taking it upon myself to preserve the ROMs that if something, God forbid, does happen, I have nobody to blame but me. But from what I've checked and, you know, I've actually reached out to people at Sculpture, it's the only version in existence. So right now you have the only version of Mortal Kombat Nitro in existence. Yeah. Which is crazy. And if you ever do release it, I think a lot of people would certainly look forward to it. And it's only for Super Nintendo, right? Yeah. But you know what? I would also, at that point, I might contemplate, you know, depending on the, the, the task at hand, of course. And, you know, if I put a team together of people, um, I'd like to see if I could upscale it in a way too and maybe do it for genesis as well even though genesis didn't need it yeah but it would be a nice touch that people could download the roms so mortal kombat 2 they go forward with it uh mk nitro was scrapped mortal kombat 2 releases in arcades june 25th 1993 eight and a half months after mk1 september 13th 1994 which is basically 14 and a half months after its arcade release. So a little longer turnaround this time, but you didn't get your hands on it until April. So really the yeah. same turnaround, but you, you got it later, so it seems longer. Uh, I was called, um, instead of Mortal Monday, Acclaim marketed it as Mortal, uh, Mortal Tuesday, right? Yeah. And there was no Mortal Kombat big ad, though, right? This wasn't the lady guys didn't do the guy. Oh, but we had street. the, the, the kick-ass commercial of Baraka. Baraka and Katana, yeah, I remember. The commercial was kick-ass, too. It was, it was. Um, it released on that day for Game Boy, Game Gear, SNES, and uh, Sega Genesis. Uh, same deal, Sculpture did the Super Nintendo, Probe, Genesis. Probe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other consoles that it was uh, launched for, this is kind of weird, Mortal Kombat 2 was a little more worldwide. Uh, it was also released for um, the PlayStation, which only came out in Japan. You guys didn't work on that version, correct? No. It came out on 32-bit uh, uh, 32X for the Sega... Genesis was, was an add-on. Yeah. It came out for Saturn, Amiga, MS-DOS. You worked on all those, though, right? The 32X, yeah. Amiga. Yeah. MS-DOS, once again, best version? Um, I don't know. I prefer, I prefer, you know, by this time, I think I prefer the, the Super Nintendo. But as far as, like, closest to the arcade, graphics-wise, sound Closest wise. to the arcade-wise, yeah, it would be... PC. The the Amiga wasn't bad at all though, but again, that's not something most people in America had access to, right? An Amiga, I, I I don't think that was very big here. The worst the worst thing for us was working on the Amiga and doing all the PAL versions, because the PAL versions, the signaling on a PAL TV, which is the European and South American market, is different. It's faster at a faster refresh rate, but man, if you watch a PAL TV. Your eyes don't get used to it. You, you get like that feeling if you came out of a pool uh, with super duper chlorine in it, and it just it hurt your. You seen a rolling like, an, oh god. But yeah, so we. I mean, we. That was the other thing. So when you say these systems, you got to remember it's these systems plus their power. So NTSC plus PAL counterparts. So if it's ten NTSC systems, it's ten counterparts to the PAL. Uh, something else to note, this is really when Mortal Kombat really began to catch fire pretty much worldwide. There was the Mortal Kombat comic book also was released. Um, they had a soundtrack that you could 
right into. They would advertise it right there on the cabinet in the attract screen. Yeah. So Mortal Kombat was pretty much everywhere. Merchandising was wild. The game was on fire in the arcades. Mortal Kombat was pretty much everywhere there. Um, Mortal Kombat 2 caused some of the biggest rumors ever. Like MK1 had the Error Macro, which was Ermac, the Red Ninja, which caused uh, Reptile to appear as red. Was it? Is that what it was? Uh, it didn't make Reptile appear as red. It made uh, anybody that was in the pit. Sometimes it was randomized. It was a, it was a glitch that was just random, but it, it, mm -hmm. it would make any of them turn red. So if Katana, if you were Katana, sometimes you got down there and uh, I mean, well, not, uh, okay, uh, I meant Raiden, like Raiden or whatever, he'd be red. All right, so you MK1 know? only had Ermac, Reptile, but Reptile was in MK2. Shang Soon was a playable character in MK2. So a lot of this in the MK1 lore was Reptile was already in the game. So you had, you had Ermac, but, but Mortal Kombat 2 gave birth to pretty much a lot of the lore that we have today, right? MK2 was the game that had all the lore. Yes. Before I get into some of this, uh, there were some things that were really infamous. Like everyone talks about the Kano transformation, which is kind of interesting because everyone swore they saw some type of Kano transformation, but it, it actually didn't exist. The character, there was, some, there was a character known as Hornbuckle, which is, there were two characters fighting on the pit. One of yeah. them was named Hornbuckle. Now, a lot of people thought this actually came from the arcade MK lore, but it didn't. Where did Hornbuckle actually come from? Hornbuckle was uh, an employee. She was an employee at Sculpture. And she wound up marrying, she wound up marrying the other guy Jeff Peters that I mentioned earlier and they, they made a hornbuckle appearance and in the MK2 home version for Super Nintendo so that was her maiden and they, name and her maiden name is hornbuckle <laughs> and it says all of a sudden he became the flame guy on the other side of the bridge of pit so how did that even happen where was this even mentioned that it was hornbuckle how did that rumor even get out they put in the game, I forgot what it was, like a who is Hornbuckle, like a reptile appearance. And I believe it was Jade at the time, which was uh, Green Fan Katana. Uh, this is on the console version. Yes. So they would randomly pop out with it. And, you know, from the home version, you know, and that was the thing. It was like we were allowed very little wiggle room to add anything we wanted and you know for super nintendo it was the hornbuckle you know the who is hornbuckle type thing and on the genesis it was the fergalities which was fergus mcgovern who was the owner of probe so what was the fergality so uh on the console version of the genesis you'd have these fergalities what was that um, I'm trying to remember how to do it again. Well, what what, what uh, was it? What happened if you performed a frugality? What actually happened? It was a clown head instead of the Dan Forden uh, head popping out on the side. It was a frugality. It was, it, and what it was was it was. Uh, it was, I'm trying to remember which, I gotta remember what the hell it was. I believe it was on the armory board. And you could only do it with Raiden. And I'm trying to remember what the hell it was. Uh, you had to do something in the test mode to enable it, too. So you had but to when you turn it, yeah, but when you turned him into a baby, it was Fergus McGovern's head. Ah, I got you. On, on the Genesis. It, it was Fergus on the Genesis. So something that's interesting is there were a lot of rumors that MK2, you actually had a book deal in MK2, correct? 
And uh, if you guys are looking at the, uh, the, 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 the video right now on YouTube, uh, I have it up there right now so you can see. You did the strategy guide for MK1 and MK2, but a lot of these rumors were introduced in the Mortal Kombat 2 strategy guide that you did for GamePro, uh, which was one of the major magazines. I think uh, the biggest are probably GamePro and EGM, Electronic Gaming Monthly. You did this for GamePro. Uh, and you introduced some of these rumors for the first time, correct? What rumors did you actually introduce and, and what did you just kind of like play into that you already heard? All right. What I had played into is, uh, you know, I had a, a friend of mine summoning that I grew up playing with. And he used to swear to me left and right that on the acid board, he seen somebody put the opponent on the hooks and perform a fatality. So... You know, for that one, I, you know, I just photoshopped it and slapped it in there for a rumor thing. And then, you know, back then people were coming up with, you know, I seen, you know, some of the craziest stuff, nudalities, this, this, this. So I, you know, I had carried weight because I worked on the game and, you know, people knew. So if I said it, it must be true. So I came up with animality. So for those listening right now, if you want to take a look at the screen, some of you guys might be listening Obviously, not going to watch a video for X amount of hours. You might be listening on your cell phone or whatever on YouTube. Take a look at your screen. I've got the rumors page up from the actual guide in which we see the animality, the polar bear. This was where the animality came from, right? This was the first of yeah. the rumor you started that's this? The first, that's, the first, that's the first one. Basically, what I did is it was a, a Japanese anime, Ranma, one half or something like that. The big panda bear, and I just... You know, from the picture, if you got the picture up, I painted them white and made them swipe you. And that's an animality. So, you know, from that point on. The Hook's fatality was something that you had heard. The Living Forest fatality, that was your rumor that you started? The the one where you uppercut him into the tree? Uppercut into the trees, yeah. And what is you this? Know, I, I, Red Robin, what is that? Okay, Red Robin. Um, you know, people had started mentioning... Ermac. Oh, there's an Ermac. They don't, they would just, they didn't, they just said there's an Ermac, you know, and so I said, all right, you know, this is, I'll make this into Ermac. And we just, and I had a friend of mine who, who went by the name Red Robin, and I just named him Red Robin and said, that's Ermac. Uh, play as Kano, play as Goro. What's this from? Because it's Goro's layer from MK1, but you have Katana and Baraka <laughs> Those... in the picture also. Those were rumors that somebody else had started, that there's a way, and, I, and I'll never forget it, because I think even I was guilty of trying it. It was some cockabamie arcade thing where they were like, yeah, you can unfree Kano and, and, go, and uh, Sonya and use them. But that was never true. The very bottom, it says, extra characters in Mortal 1. This is actually... Mortal Kombat Nitro, is it not? I see the select that's screen, I see screen. Reptile, Shang Tsung, and Goro. Yeah. That's an actual screen. Those are, both of those shots are screenshots of Mortal Kombat Nitro. Uh, actually, Super quite Nintendo, uh, Mortal Kombat Nitro. I see in the select screen, I see there's a, a new layer on the bottom, three characters, Goro, Shang Tsung, and Reptile. Uh, again, for those who are listening, if you look at your screen right now, I, I have the article up, the very bottom panel. So you see MK1, Nitro Edition, Goro, Shang Tsung, Reptile, Selectable. We see Reptile doing the spear, Shang Tsung throwing fireballs. You took these screenshots of MK Nitro. Uh, and this was okay? Like nobody minded that you, you kind of put this in, in, the, in the guide? Uh, I kind of had no choice. I never asked. <laughs> I never asked anybody. I just did it. He just put them in. I just said, you know what, it's not, you know, my attitude was it's not coming out, so I could go it. You know, it's, it's, what, it's what if the rumors were true. That's what I labeled it that for a reason. Speaking of the book deals, and, and this was one of them, uh, the, uh, you had several book deals uh, for this game, Mortal Kombat 1, MK2, MK3, MK4. You did three guides for MK4, correct? did arcade and home version and, and a revision too because what happened and it was funny 
Uh, and they did it to me twice, actually. Uh, when working on the arcade, they did the first book, and then they changed the moves of the game. I also had to do a revision, too. You know, again, no patching back then. Eventually, Brady Games caught on, and they just started saying, you know what, we can't keep paying the guy to, to keep doing books every time these companies change it. So they would just give you updates on the websites. You also did Mortal Sub-Zero Mythologies, right? The uh, Yeah, Mythologies. You did Mace and your favorite game that I always tell you for. Guys. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more interesting than that, Acclaim during this time was a lot more than just Mortal Kombat, although MK was pretty much a staple of the, uh, of Acclaim. They did games such as Terminator 2, Revolution X, NARC, Smash TV, Super High Impact Football. You also did WWF the arcade game before it was WWE. And NBA Jam. Uh, before we get to NBA Jam, so the arcade game had a fatality for just Undertaker in the arcade. Never made yes. it to console. Talk about that. What happened? Why did it not make it to console? Why were there not more added? Um... Because basically, you know, the process for any IP is at the end of the day, he who, he who owns the actual IP has final say. You know, and I guess, you know, the people at WWF at the time, you know, were like, yeah, no, nah, we can't have any fatalities. So, I mean, they left The Undertaker. I could have swore they removed The Undertaker stuff. I think in, in the, the console versions it was removed. Yeah, but I could have sworn in a later version of the ROMs they might have removed it too. They maybe they I had planned to. Everyone was going to get some type of finisher, but WWF said no. Yeah, yeah. Not uh, too many people at that time were cool with killing each other. Oh, well, I'm thinking they didn't kill you, but they figured you know eventually someone's going to slice somebody in half, and we're not going to have that. <laughs> NBA Doink Jam is interesting. So this is interesting because Midway had the actual NBA license for the teams and Acclaim had the NBA Players Association license. So you guys were symbionts. You guys couldn't make the game without each other, right? Uh, you yeah. couldn't do the console version without the NBA rights. Uh, which well, we, eventually, we eventually wound up, you know, and again, I think this was a shady Acclaim move. But we eventually wound up securing it. And so that's when you claim, you know. But it was kind of like they say, well, a claim doesn't have the NBA rights. They're doing the console version for us. And we have the rights to do the teams. And when their arcade version came out with the player names, you could say, well, we have the Players Association rights. They're doing this for us as well on the arcade side. And we're, you know, we're basically subletting our arcade li uh, our PA license, NBA PA. Yeah. So it was kind of like you guys had to work in conjunction to get this game out on both arcades and consoles. Well, they, I mean, I don't know what the inner workings on the deal was between mid. I, know, I remember my boss going back and forth to the NBA, wheeling and dealing. That's all I remember. And I remember, you know, uh, that. Whatever deal had been secured down the road, I guess a claim took ownership of it, and Midway was forced to go with John Doe's. You know, I think it was in Hang Time, maybe, which was like the third or fourth iteration. You know, I know NBA Jam and, T and NBA Jam TE had the players, but at a certain point, I believe they lost the names of the players. And we got them. Now, in a early beta for these games, you said there were actually fatalities that you could yeah, do. There was, well, there was one fatality. Basically, okay. if you picked Scorpion. Um, so for those that don't know, when you enter your initials, if you entered a certain initial and passcode, et cetera, you could get access to certain hidden characters. And, and this was in tournament, tournament edition, I believe, right? Yeah. And... You had like Scorpion, etc. A few MK characters, a few hidden characters in general. Uh, Scorpion being one of them. And in a, in a beta, it never made it to arcade or console. Scorpion could actually do a fatality. Talk about that. 
first of all, for the record, it's SCO July 6th. That's to get Scorpion. But no one will ever be able to do that because it was in the beta. So no one will ever get it. No, Scorpion's still in it. But not the fatality. The fatality, no. That was... I want to say it was either up and down on the pad and you had to hit turbo like 25 times. What and it would come up. How could you... Even, what were the conditions in which you could even do this fatality? And you would get on fire. Uh, after getting three shots in a row, which means your fourth shot would not miss. If you pushed the guy when you were on fire, it put them on fire, and they would go into the, you know, the animation for when Scorpion uh, did the fucking the head mask, and they fall to the floor and burn. And NBA clearly said, "Yeah, no." So it was in the beta, never made it to the arcade because NBA said, "Absolutely not. You're not." Yeah. Yeah. David Stern at that time. Commissioner was like, yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen. No. <laughs> they were like, nah, take that out. You ain't killing basketball players. A claim, uh, MK2 was the last Mortal Kombat that a claim did, right? They didn't do three or... They did something. You know, I was gone, but they did something with a Euro version. One of the versions they actually wound up getting for some reason. I don't know what the deal was. I was not involved in it. But they did manage to, to, to release one MK3 for some system somewhere. I forgot what the the situation was. So they didn't, they didn't get the, the major console. I mean, you didn't work no. on MK3, right? That wasn't something no. that you... No. That wasn't something that you did. Uh, MK3 was pretty much released, you know, uh, I think the version of MK3 that everybody played was the PlayStation version. PS1 was pretty much the bee's knees at that time, and uh, Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis were kind of becoming an afterthought in the console wars as, uh, you know, PlayStation. And regular MK3, Saturn never got a version that they only got a trilogy, so... Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think Acclaim did that at all. No. So it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, really MK1, MK2 really kind of built the legacy that Mortal Kombat has today. Uh, I wanted to do this because you, you hear a lot about the arcade history, but in reality, arcades were not something that were frequented by the majority of the public at that point, at least in America. While the arcade era certainly boomed in the mid 90s a lot of people you know 14 15 16 they had to wait at home you know they, they, their mom was not driving them to the mall every day of the week so a lot of these these guys who are uh you know late 30s mid 30s now kind of got into mortal kombat not so much in the arcade but more so on the console version of the game Secrets were a big deal back then, as we talked about, uh, you know, because the arcade owners had to make some money. So obviously, you know, uh, Ed Boon, the final version of MK2, Ed Boon, Tobias, they put in, you know, Kano Transformation, Sean Attacks, which will always say zero because they were just rumors to keep people putting yeah. money in. But fatalities became a big deal. Like Street Fighter, you know, combos, you could see what everybody was doing and, and you could figure the moves out for yourself and, and put the combos together. But fatalities, there's really no way to figure this out. Some people were in disbelief when I spoke about this earlier that because Midway was so secretive, the players kind of, because they had a goal, yeah, they were very secretive as well. And they did used to cover their hands, correct? I mean, some people, you would ask for the fatal, they wouldn't tell you. And if you tried to watch, people actually would cover their hands so that you couldn't see the fatality, correct? There were some weird people out there that would actually put a box over their hands when they played it. There was a guy that used to come into the arcade that had, it looked like a big shoe box, and he would put his hands underneath it and then put the box over his hands and the buttons so it covered them completely. That's how bad people went to lengths. To, like, like, this guy had to... Get this box, cut it out to make it so like it fits over his wrists 
and sits on the on the actual arcade. Like he had to map this out. That's how desperate people got to hold on to what they got. So he cut slots out for his wrists. <laughs> yeah. Put the box over his hands and he would play. Yeah. There's just so much. I mean, a lot of people just kind of enjoy the product that they have now, but they don't really realize where it came from. And a lot of MK lore was certainly in the arcade, but I would say the majority that most of the people in America at least played was the console version over the arcade version. And this is what got a lot of people hooked on MK. And I really wanted to go over this because it's, it's, it was a big part of history, you know, and you hear, you see a lot of videos about the arcade history of it and, and the development of the arcade versions, but there's not much out there of anything about how the game was developed on the console. If I were to ask you to sum up your experience working on both MK1 and MK2, what was that like for you to be, you know, working, at, now that you look back on it and you see what Mortal Kombat became, Kind of put this into perspective, being someone who was right there on the ground floor uh, working on bringing the game to the consoles. I mean, for me, it's, you know, uh, as I gotten older and I look back at it, it's definitely a rush. Like, you know, I have older, like you said, guys in their 30s coming up to me going, oh, my God, you know, I, I've been a fan of Mortal Kombat. But, you know, like you said, it was the home version that got me hooked. I wasn't allowed to go to the arcade back then. You know, it's 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 a great experience to have. You know, it's flattering, should I say, to have somebody come up to you and be like, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, people told me, you know, especially when it comes to the the lore of James M K in the scene, you know, to have people that come up to me and go, I had no idea. You know, nobody ever told. You know, somebody told me you worked on the actual home games. You know. There's people out there that'll, you know, the rumors have been started that I worked at Midway. No, I never worked at Midway. No, I never worked for NRS. I just worked for a claim, you know, and it, it, it was a, I would never trade the experience, you know, is what it comes down to for me. But I will say I wish it went better. You know, it's a, it's a tough industry to work in. Um, the hours are absolutely unforgiving, you know, but the end product, and I think really that's what it comes down to, at least it did for me, is the expression on somebody, whether it's, you know, fatalities or, you know, just, you know, the way it looks, the way it sounds, the way it feels, to make that game come as to the arcade as I could was my biggest you know, it's always to bring that to the home. You know, so for me, you know, again, I would never trade it. Uh, would I get back in that industry? Probably not. You know, probably not. But, you know, I mean, I I got tons of ideas still buried in my head. You know, so one never knows. But, you know, again, like we were saying earlier about the Mortal Kombat Nitro, you know, maybe I maybe I'll delve my foot into this. And try to make something. Yeah, well, it's definitely awesome to kind of hear the history of this uh, and, and put it out there for everybody to kind of listen to. Uh, definitely awesome experience for sure. I I certainly played the games in the arcades. I, I wasn't much of a console guy. I was more of an arcade player. Back then, you were either one or the other. You know, the the, the controls were so different. Arcade console. You either one or the other for sure. Um, you know, it's funny. I could play. I could play MK1, MK2 on SNES and Genesis pads. After that, I can't play MK1 on anything but an arcade stick set up with the Mortal Kombat layout. It has to. You can't give me a six-button control uh, stick. I can't play Mortal Kombat. Any of them, you know, and it's it's always been weird. I can't, I can't make that transition because, I guess, because working on the pads was one thing. You know, again, that was you're basically forced to because back then there were no arcade sticks, and until PDP came out with their stick, I couldn't play Mortal Kombat. But I could play 3D ones 
on a PlayStation. Well, you could get a Moss stick. Moss Systems was an arcade cabinet kind of cut in half kind of stick, but they didn't sell the Mortal Kombat layout. MK was such a weird layout with the way high punch, low punch, I kick, go kick, block, uh, and then run was added in, in MK3. You know what? You know what we did though, or what I did? I turned around. Remember the, uh, like when you were in high school, how you had the desk and it was the chair connected together? Yeah, I remember those. I had taken a Super Nintendo controller, opened it up, and soldered each of the button maps to a button and cut the holes in the desk and put an arcade stick wire to the pad and all the buttons and you, I could sit and it was an arcade stick built into a desk built into a desk yeah that's crazy but it was like you know what are you gonna do hey 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 Brady I'm coming over let me bring my desk bring my desk yeah game. I played on stick up until MK versus DC that's only because I had friends that played on on the PlayStation uh, version, there was a bug in which you could only have two people couldn't have individual control so if I changed my buttons to match my stick then the other person on the pad their buttons were rearranged <laughs> it was a weird bug so I just said okay I learned the pad and it was much easier as I got older going to tournaments to go through the airport without a big stick I remember I went through the airport right as we invaded, right after 9-11 right as we uh, occupied uh, Iraq and uh, we were on high alert, and I was going to a tournament, and I had on our the big Moss system stick, and I go through the airport, I'm going to security, and they're like, what is this? this is, they're looking at me like, this is a bomb, and I'm like, I'm going to a video game tournament. This is, you know, early 2000s, you know, 2001, 2000, I mean, I don't know, what, whatever year that was. And they're like, you're going to a video game tournament. They looked at me like, this dude's trying to blow the plane up. You know, I, I missed my flight. I was, I mean, it was, it was a mess. You know, I had to get another one because they held me. For After a while, I hated my, my little time of lugging sticks around competing since yeah. MK9. Well, at that, like, point, yeah. at that point, Mad Cats hadn't become what it is today. Sticks were pretty much garbage almost all the way around. They weren't made with quality parts. So Moss Systems was the way to go. But like I said, it was like sawing off half an arcade cabinet. Uh, but... Yeah, for me, I, I played a lot of the games in, in the arcade, mainly dabbled with it on console, not too much. Uh, I was more into the competitive scene in the arcade. But, you know, yeah, it's just crazy. You know, a, a lot of this lore never gets told. So I'm, I'm really glad that I, I got it out there. And uh, hopefully everyone that's listening can kind of enjoy this. I really like, uh, I'll put it up there again one more time if you guys are, 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 are uh, want to put the, uh, the video up. Um, surprise! Surprise you didn't. Surprise you didn't mention the evil side of my of the law, my MK4 story, which you. Uh no, it'll be for another day. You know the MK4 <laughs> stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, here it is again. Once again, I got it up on video. If you guys want to want to take a look at it again, the 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 page that really started a lot of the rumors: Sub Zero's polar bear, the living forest fatality. Uh, and an image, the only image out there that I know of that's of Mortal Kombat Nitro, correct, was in here. This was the only image that was ever... That was the only one that was ever published. Now, what was funny was, and if, you know, Tabmock99 has a site, MK Pavilion, and on it he has all the rumors. So now, the rumor actually reemerged, like Boone started the rumor during MK3. So what had happened is, you know, I had a website called Fighter's Edge back then. Like, again, this is like HTML 1.0, you know, not, not much that was happening. And we actually made another version of Mortal Kombat Nitro based off of uh, MK3 or UMK3, should I say. And it was it was characters from that added plus new characters, which was kind of funny too because I after I had spoke to you I I googled and I and I looked and I came across Tabmok's page and I'm like wow he still has the links to that original page I think that one was in like from like '96 maybe and all the links work on it it's got story mode everything you know so between that. In Boone's uh, Amiga version, <coughs> this those pictures on that on that MK2 book are the only original versions of Mortal Kombat Nitro. 
Well, for everybody listening, I'll keep you guys posted on this MK Nitro. If uh, Jimmy ever decides to release it, I'll keep you guys posted. And if he does, I'll put images and everything up about it. Uh, Jimmy, this was awesome. And I want to thank you for, for being a guest here and really telling the story. This is a huge part of the history of the game that's pretty much been lost for 30 years, just about. So I really wow. appreciate it. Not a problem, man. Anytime. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, I really appreciate all the support. And uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments of this. You want to see more stuff like this? Just let me know what you'd like to see and I'll deliver it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned for more content.